Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global, our first hour is general discussion about media and, per and, uh, and virtual production. Uh, and our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about 3D printing. Uh, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about how we approach it and, and what to think about uh, when you're buying a 3D printer and when you're using 3D printers and how to use them. So stay tuned for that. And if, again, if you'd like to get more about, more about our schedule, go to Office Hours. Dot global. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? We start with one from the Seventh Scroll, our friends in Brooklyn, New York, and they say, "Morning, guys. From for the panel, on average, how many computers, tablets, and uh, similar do you operate in your studios, production flows for streaming, audio, and so forth?" Good, Courtney. Well, in my setup here, I have a big Dell. I have, uh, which is the main one that's used for Zoom. I have a tablet PC that's uh, running Windows over here, an eight-inch Hewlett-Packard tablet that's a touchscreen, running the touch version of Unity. And I have, uh, of course, a uh, a Melee Windows computer that's running as a backup and one of the inputs of the uh, ATEM that is there in case uh, the Dell dies, which it occasionally does. <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. Okay, so let's see if I can quickly show you guys what what I'm looking at. Uh, all right. So that is my teleprompter, my ICANN, the uh, twelve inch. I behind that I have an iPhone tennis Max that's showing. Um, that you're seeing uh, when I'm on camera. This is the monitor. Oh, I'm showing the back end. So let me switch switch to YouTube. So, and then there is that's the M M1 Mac Mini monitor. Over here, I have uh, a regular iPad Pro. That is the multi view out. That is. Uh, iPad Pro and another iPad Pro and that is it. I remember so, when, when <laughs> this is what happened when Tony started. He had a laptop and some headphones. <laughs> That's what <Yep. laughs> he just kind of grown into this. It's great. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. That's an awesome studio, Tony. Um, I'm using four. Uh, Z series uh, HP workstations, which uh, I have for rendering and for just biz general business apps. I've got an M1 Mac. I've got an old classic 2015 Mac Pro, which uh, I love. I've had it upgraded uh, several times or maybe a couple of times. And I'm um, looking forward to the new Mac Pro that will be announced at WWDC. So that's what I got. You go ahead, Bill. I'm just driving a Mac laptop and one iPad Pro on the side, which I only use through the ATEM switcher to get content into something if I need to show somebody something. But l literally, one MacBook Pro, 16-inch, uh, and it's the model before the new M1s came out. I haven't upgraded yet. I'm waiting to see how it settles out because this is doing everything I need. I do have five monitors attached to everything, but only one computer. Yeah, I have... Um... I have an iMac, an older iMac, actually, that I that I just jump onto the um, uh, that I jump onto this show with. Uh, but I also have a, a, a new studio as well as an M1 uh, Mini and an older Mini that does this. That does, all it does is the, the telestration um, that that's there, um, and that's that's my home system. I I took one of my Mac Minis into the office, and so the office has uh, for when we do actual events, um, it has all the computers that we can get uh, for our systems, I, for our main system that brings in folks through Zoom rooms, which we're going to probably uh, put to sleep uh, over the summer or actually expand over the summer to something else, but um, you know, 16 Dell blades. Um, and then uh, this this show is actually done, I think on, I think we have, I mean, there's a lot of them. There's probably 15, 15 computers that produce this show because we have ones on JJ's side as well as uh, five Mac minis that, that run the Zoom ISO. So it's a, um, so there's a, there's a lot of computers involved with uh, getting this stuff going. Um, next question. Next one comes from Tom Ferguson in Phoenix, Arizona. The CEO of Sony's Semiconductor Division claims that smartphone cameras will exceed the quality of SLR cameras soon, specifically by 2024. Really? And he's got a link there. Go ahead, Tom. 
Well, I'm just wondering if the semiconductor division CEO ever talks to the SLR division CEO, because I can't even imagine making such a statement on online. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, maybe what he meant was by 2024, the chips that they put in phones will be the equivalent to what, uh, or maybe a little bit better than what they're putting in the cameras now. Of course, they don't have the same size of sensor, so you're not going to get the same kind of image. But with computational photography from the uh, AI chips and that are built into the uh, phones, the phones have much more computational power than I think most of the cameras do unless they're doing custom silicone. So with software and computational photography, I think they can get a better image out of the smaller sensors. Okay, Bill. What Courtney said, I have been flabbergasted by how I, I literally have shot one and a half of my last four projects exclusively on the phone. And the client likes the picture of that better than uh, everything other than uh, my Blackmagic 6K, that goes to a serious colorist. If I send something out and somebody, I get two or three people involved and it's something for a broadcast spot or something like that, that footage can be massaged into being even more refined than the phone. But in terms of just a picture that you set and forget and you put on the web, the phone is astonishing at how well it handles differences in lighting, all the things that were bad about learning photography and learning to use video cameras in the early days, lack of contrast, uh, bad colorometry and stuff like that has been mostly solved. And that computational photography in the iPhones that I'm using, particularly in the last few, last couple, uh, has just produced some stunning results and the clients love it. Good, Mitchell. It's a very provocative statement because it's it's making the assumption that somehow that the iPhone will be better than your uh, mirrorless well, this or Sony. SLR. <laughs> this is Sony. This is Sony. They're not even. Yeah, I know, iPhone. and it's like they're they're making they're kind of chopping their hand off despite their face, so to speak. But I, I'm one of those people that feel there's a time and a place for everything. There's a place to use your iPhone uh, to capture images, and nothing will top. Uh, the subtleties and the art of using a camera with the proper lens and the proper settings, that's, that's a tough one to top with, a, uh, with an iPhone. So that's the provocative part. There is real no comparison. One is good for one thing, and the other thing is good for other stuff. Yeah, the interesting thing is, is the reason that I um, uh, stopped really using an SLR on a day-to-day -day basis, because I had one that I carried around all the time, GPS. Like, like literally GPS. Um, so properly clocking and locating where I'm taking the photos is so useful for me on my iPhone that I stopped. I just was like, Oh, now I got to figure out now I have to figure out where these pictures were taken and everything else. And it just, it's just like this ad added pain in the neck that I had to deal with. Um, and I really decided that, well, if it, if it, if I, I do take a round of photos with my SLR every year of the, of the family, just make sure I have those cause they are better than the iPhone. But, I, the GPS is the killer app. And I know that they make little things to add on. They should build them into every camera because it just, it, it changes the way you sort it. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I agree with everybody here on the panel because uh, GPS, for instance, yes, they're building that into some of the cameras, but it works very poorly compared to the phones. Yeah. And I just can't imagine though that, you know, here it is Sony, they build SLR cameras. Yeah, but their their SLR uh, business is going into the into the tank. So I so here's what they're doing is they're they're I mean I'll, I'll tell you that what what when someone when an executive gets up and does that, they're basically gaslighting the whole industry because they've given up on it. So that's I mean that's you know they they're not <laughs> they're not trying they they have they have a lot of they don't have SLR but they have little video cameras and video cameras are a big business for Sony. Their their SLR business is not not a big deal. I mean it's it's getting eaten up by the cameras. So I think that they're they're basically um, lighting a bomb as they leave the house. Um, go ahead, Courtney, real quick. Yeah, they uh, Sony makes a lot of the sensors in the older iPhones. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. but um, the new this new one they're talking about is a dual layer that puts the transistors behind the photoreceptors, so it takes up you can get a much more higher resolution image because the transistors for each pixel are behind on another layer, and uh, so they're saying that they they can achieve a better resolution than the iPhone 14 sensor is in there. But um, uh, what was I going to say? The other thing to realize that, that uh, 
the lenses are a lot smaller in a phone, and so it's much harder to get a higher quality lens in that small a size than it is with a DSLR. Yeah, and, and I think that the thing is, is, if they're just talking about resolution, I think that, that they are going to easily pass the SLRs. The pro and then the computational photography is doing a lot of the work for dark images. Um, you know, so fixing stuff for low light is the computational photography. The depth of field for computational photography is not working just yet, but they're getting there. Go ahead, Bill. Market size and ecosystem also have to be taken into consideration. There are so many people who are using phone photography for something, and so the number of add-ons, the gimbals and the rest of that that are now being specifically designed for phone. I know for me, uh, when we were out doing the rocket launch, I got shocked when I was riding in the back of that pickup truck and we were bouncing all over heck. I mean, literally going through the desert and that combination of the little DJI gimbal and my phone's internal stabilization got me a rock solid picture better than most steady cam operators that I've seen while in the most wild motion possible. If they keep doing things like that, building out this ecosystem of mounts and other things because the market is so big i think this gap is going to narrow really fast yeah I, I think again it's it's there are definitely when i take pictures with an slr i definitely can see the difference between the two but i don't know if the average person can um you know for, for most of those things um, next question Next one comes from Danny Law in Malaysia here on the panel. How would you prevent the copying URL of an embedded live stream YouTube video and also prevent viewers from stopping or rewinding the live stream? The question, the second question is easy because you can turn that off in, in the, in your settings for, um, for stopping and rewinding, turn off the DVR. I mean, you can turn off the DVR function um, and it will, uh, there's a DVR function and there's a playback function, but one, one or both of those will basically put you in a live status. And so the only thing you can see on it is live. Um, and people do that primarily because they want to put up a cleaner version later or they want to keep everybody synced. They don't want people to watch it at different times. So they really get the same experience and that helps sync the chat. Um, the, um, the embedded live stream, the best way to keep people from uh, copying the URL is use Vimeo or <laughs> some other uh, you know system that, that lets you Turn that off. Ustream, Vimeo, um, a variety of other ones will do that. Uh, Vimeo is probably the most popular one now. Um, YouTube's business model is that we give you the the bandwidth for free, but we want to bring people back to YouTube. That's the that's the the trade off. And so they, I, I don't think that there's any way to turn off the ability to, to string through it. There, there had been. Um, I mean, there are some services within YouTube, I think, that can do that, but but I don't think on an average, for an average account, you can do that. Go ahead, Bill. Before bed last night, I, I actually was on, I think, Netflix, or one of the services, it could have been Netflix, could have been Prime, and I noticed that the movie that I had some vague interest in watching was going to expire in seven minutes. So I really quickly went on, downloaded it to my phone, started watching it, but then in about uh, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes in, I realized I wanted to, I had to go out of the room and I thought I'd go back and I rewound. When I rewound, it killed the movie because it had expired. Yeah. So they have a lot of back end stuff that really mm -hmm. controls whether or not these feeds happen and when you can access right. content. So there's a lot of ecosystem behind this. Next question. Next question comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle, and he simply says, what inspires you? Go ahead, John. Guy Cochran inspires me. He flips upside down on his wall and does push-ups, has <laughs> lots of cool toys, and he drinks green stuff. He inspires me a lot. <laughs> Go ahead, Danny. Well, I guess uh, the obvious is the people in this community, you know, how, how we, we spur one another to do things better, to discover new ways to collaborate remotely. I mean, those things just, you know, inspire me to the max. That's great. Uh, Mitchell? Craftsmanship, no matter where it is. Uh, Norm Abrams is retiring from WGBH and this old house or this old workbench. And just seeing that, it's just fascinating to watch. I have no interest in building a house or a, a bench or a chair, uh, but just watching people work well. And uh, when I buy a piece of equipment, I can be inspired to buy it based on its design. Of course, Apple's always done a great job. So there you go. Go ahead, uh, Tom. Well, learning and the gathering of knowledge and then the application of said knowledge. And thus, I'm here in the office hours community. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, Good, Tony. A few years ago, I was uh, watching 
office hours while I was going through cancer treatment. And I had no idea that I would be in the position that I am in now in that tonight I'll be celebrating 50 episodes of conversation with Tony Mobley. So I am inspired by this community and the things that it has encouraged me to try that I didn't even think I could even accomplish. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Courtney. You know, what inspires me is people who think outside the box, who, will re, who can take some useless piece of old junk and turn it into something useful again by cobbling it together with other things and, and create new things out of old things. That's what inspires me. Yeah, I think excellent craftsmanship, um, people doing things that are uh, sacrificing selflessly, I think is something, you know, at, at all levels. That, that can be a very minor thing. It can be a major thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, someone stepping in front of a you know a train or something like that it's just that just just someone doing something like that i'm just uh sacrificing uh not doing something just for their own personal gain i think is something that inspires me um and uh yeah and just people making a difference like just watching people make a difference inspires me um, next question john nichols in concord california says what are your recommendations for storage containers for around the home studio what are your strategies for organizing grouping cables adapters and things like that go ahead danny well uh containers are not too big so that when you pick it up you don't break your back that's one thing uh, second is that i have learned to use transparent containers uh, because it forces me to be more thoughtful in how i use those containers and of course it's faster to to look you know at a glance, you know, where things are at. As far as how I organize things, I organize them by um, functional groups. So if it's uh, my, to make sure that if it's a mic, you know, if there are some mics in the box, there's uh, XR cables, whatever adapters that I need, so that just by bringing up that container, I have all that I need to, to, to use the things. Yeah. Right, Courtney? Uh, yeah, what I look for, and especially if we're going to get into 3D printing later on, is something like this that... Uh, is um, uh, sealed transparent containers like this uh, because they seal out moisture. A lot of uh, 3D printing uh, spools of filament are hygroscopic, so they absorb water and they become uh, unprintable after they absorb water. So you got to keep them dry. And so it's a good idea to keep all of your cables and stuff dry, keep them in a, uh, as they say, cool, dry place. So something like that is uh, always handy. And at least the fact that you can see through it and tell what's in it without having to open it up is uh, a plus. Good, Bill. And a strategy that I've tried to employ more and more over the years is what I call kitification, which is if I have a device and it has a specific power supply and it needs two short USB-C cables and it needs a mounting arm, I try to buy all those things, put it into a kit and put it in some kind of bag. I find that if I'm taking the thing out, then I have to go look for a cable and find the right one. Then I have to remember where the where I left the power supplies because it's in a box with a bunch of other power supplies. It becomes almost impossible to use. So I'm trying to kitify as much stuff as I can so that everything I need to use that device for its intended purposes in one place. Which is, I, I take the opposite, which is I try to keep everything in its own groupings, but I, I, use, I change my kit so often that I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. So I want all my mic stands in one place and all my mics in another place and I, you know and i just want to know i can pick up from a from column a and then column b the um i like uh, uh pegboards a lot i've kind of grown up with them so i'm used to using lots and lots and lots of pegboards because i can kind of like put hangers and you know i've got a pegboard over here that i have hangers and i have little trays that stick out that i can drop stuff into and keep everything in a you know relatively ordered uh way another thing for cables is anything under uh, usually under three feet, but sometimes under six feet and definitely under three feet. You can get these, I can't remember what they're called, but they're basically, uh, you know, um, a plane of little slots and you just hang your cables. And what happens is they don't tend to get twisted so much and they, they're easy to, they're easy to get to. And I keep all my, a lot of my SDI cables all on those in different lengths and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we used a little bit of both of those. Um, we built uh, for our for our warehouse. We had what we called cable boats. <laughs> they were they had um, a these big tr troughs at the bottom. We throw anything that was like fifty feet or more uh, into those, and that kept it weighted down. Well, we, now we were using very expensive casters. I think the casters were like one hundred and thirty bucks each or something like that, and so that they would keep rolling nicely because there was a lot of weight on one side. We had 
uh, pegboard and everything was all coiled. So all the coils of something were on one side. On the other side, we had the hang, the hanging ones across the top and all the three footers would all hang down from there. And we had one for video, <clears throat> sorry, one for audio and one for IT, um, I, you know, IP. And um, what you could do is you pull them over when you're working on a kit, you could just pull them over to the around you. And then all the cables are all there. You can just go grab them. And when you go to the next place that you need to do them, you just pull the cable <laughs> boat where you need it to go uh, to make it work. Go ahead, Mitchell. I like using those little uh, magnetic hangers that you can stick on the side of a rack. They just boom, and then they've got a hook on them. And, you know, all my patch cables and um, uh, cables that I use to get stuff from here to there on a, in, in the rack are always right. there at arm's, arm's length. And uh, for the rest of it, there's a gigantic pile of stuff in my back room that I enjoy uh, rooting through every few weeks. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes from Danny Law again in Malaysia. I'm beginning to wonder, rather than trying to manipulate the M1 Mac Mini to give four to five display outputs, would it just be advisable to get a Mac Ultra that has six Thunderbolt 4 outs plus an HDMI? Thoughts? Go ahead, John. I had the same problem when I hooked up my M1. I've got two LG 5Ks and the M1 won't drive those. And so I've got one 5K and then a 4K. And so the studio is is a, a nice machine for multiple monitors until we see Mac Pros next month. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. I like your thinking, Danny. It's exactly the same direction I'm going. I just say get your uh, order in because I ordered mine in mid-March and now it's been punched out to July. Yeah, the, the wait on anything that has anything special to it is very, very long. Uh, but but I do think that um, trying to get an, a Mac Mini to do more than two two monitors, it's just everybody I've talked to, like they get it to work, but not well. <laughs> so so it so I, I think that if you're trying to do more than two monitors, I would definitely look at look very seriously at at the studio. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael says, with Broadcom starting uh, stating that they plan to rapidly transition VMware customers to subscriptions, what alternative virtualization platforms have you investigated? Good, John. Oracle VirtualBox. It's open source and free for personal use. It works great. I think that about 80% of the users will just move to the subscription. They'll be upset. They'll be frustrated. <laughs> they'll talk about how much they hate Broadcom. And they'll still buy it because they don't know how to, they don't have, you know, the, the cost of moving it will be higher than, or at least the perceived cost of moving it will be higher than the perceived cost of changing. But I agree with John, there's, there's open source solutions. It's just that you have to know what you're doing to, to make those, make those work. Uh, next question. Alex Golner of Alex 4D fame in London. Tell us about the WWDC second hours on Monday to Thursday of next week. And he has the link there uh, shown at officehours.global. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Yes, I actually found this not by going to the Office Hours Global website. I found this by clicking through on the Apple developer app and going to <laughs> WWDC and seeing yeah. what was beyond WWDC. And then it said Office Hours. I thought, oh, I've heard of that. And I went and found a web page, uh, the homepage, which actually looks kind of uh, Apple-y in its style. Um, and I do find it interesting. There's two events on Monday. And the the fact that Apple advised possibly that it would be a good idea to copy it to cover the specific two areas, namely video and audio updates for developers on Tuesday, which is what I'm interested in, and AR and 3D updates for developers on Wednesday. So I'm glad there's going to be stuff to talk about, let's hope. Uh, and then, of course, a final discussion of all things on Thursday. Um, also, I note that it's possible to register now in various groups in what are called digital lounges on the various topics, which I've registered for, which is like effectively a temporary Slack with Apple folks in on various topics. And I've registered for audio and video and also design. Uh, so essentially, you can just be a part of all the developers who are interested in those things next week, chatting away about stuff to do with, in the case of audio and video and design. So I, And you're going to join I, us on at least Tuesday and Wednesday, right? Or at least Tuesday. I will. I will try. I am flying uh, to Rome on that day, that afternoon. So I'll I'll do what I can. <laughs> Does that mean we're getting new hardware? Yeah, yeah, Alex traveling used to be. <laughs> yeah, used to be the signal of new hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, one of the things is that you know we're we because of where we promote 
office hours we're a pretty heavy mac community so or apple community so um so wwc is a pretty big thing for us because it really sets the pace for the rest of the year um so so i think that it's a it's a big opportunity there to to um to to cover it um, and obviously our coverage of it gets a little bit of pr from from, from apple's web page so um it, it, uh, it's actually the we grow more around WWDC than any other the, our coverage last year um literally added more people to our our viewership and group uh than anything we've ever done <laughs> so, so so obviously we're paying we're doubling down on that on that opportunity um the um uh we're changing you know the monday is we're going to cover the keynote in a second year experience and so i have to sit down with mickey and make sure that my stuff's working but we're gonna it's it's a little interesting we're gonna put it in so that we can hear it through comms but it doesn't go into the show so that we can be truly a second ear experience you can watch it on one thing and listen to us chitter chatter on the other um about about what we're looking at and then in the evening of course we've got renee and justine and we also i mean it's 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 a pretty um it's a pretty interesting group of folks that we that we have jumping into it so i so i think that um uh, it's going to be a, um, a, a very interesting, we, we wanted to balance it with folks that are pundits, but also Adam Toe, of course, does Mix Effect Pro and, uh, Ayur Pro, uh, Prochaska, who is part of the audio kit team, you know, they're, they're doing the, you know, they're, they they build the audio kit tools. Um, you know, not, not for Apple, but you know, it's the audio, um, kit separately. So we have two people that are like deep in it, you know, that are, that are mixed with, you know, kind of pundits, you know, in that, in that area. So I think that'll be an interesting uh, discussion on Monday night. And then, uh, yeah, Tuesday, we're looking really at, for us, it, it's really, uh, it's, it's WWC, but really focused towards office hours. Like we're not covering maps, <laughs> you know, like we're not, we're not covering, like we're not covering everything that comes out in WWC. I'm sure there'll be plenty of cool things that come out in WWC that don't have anything to do with us. And we're not going to bother to talk about it, maybe a little on Thursday. Um, but, but I think that, um, for us, video, obviously audio and video is very important. And, and I believe that the AR 3D, 3D stuff is going to be important. So it's an opportunity for us to really, you know, dig into those subjects and, and, um, and really discuss them among ourselves. And um, we are going to have some guests, um, some developers that are going to jump on. I'm just finalizing those, those folks. Um, but we're going to have some developers that are jumping on, um, on Tuesday and Wednesday, at least, and if not Thursday to talk about, you know, so we'll have their two cents as well um as we as we go forward so so it should be a should be a good week and between between nam and Cinegear, it is a, and, then I, and then i'm speaking at infocom remotely um the the, the um uh so it's it's a, next week is a it's a busy week <laughs> uh, ne ne uh next question chris widener's up next from lafayette indiana and chris says i've been experimenting with external video capture on android and have had several breakthroughs what would you do if you could bring in a 1080 atem feed to native mobile apps good courtney that'd be interesting because it'd allow me to repurpose old phone old android phones into little video recorders however you i suppose would have to have some type of uh, converter that converts a HDMI to a USB camera input, I guess, for those phones. I guess that's how you're bringing video into them. Uh, so that'd be really interesting. I currently use these uh, um, capture uh, devices like this one or uh, this one here, which is the Clear Click. They're about 119 bucks, and you can just pass through any HDMI video signal to it, and it records locally on a USB thumb drive in H.264, 1080p, or 720p. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about uh, uh, anything taking up uh, any of your hard drive storage, etc. But uh, and they work pretty good. But they're about 100 and some odd dollars. But if I could repurpose an old Android phone, that would be interesting with just an app that I could find on the App Store. Yeah, I think for us, a lot of us, the, the biggest use would be to stream to stream high quality video to in, um, Instagram. <laughs> that's the, that's the thing that uh, Instagram. There's some back doors. What's interesting about this is that if you go into an Android and you, and it shows up on Instagram, you're technically not breaking the terms of service of Instagram. You are streaming from a mobile device. This is called following the letter of the law, but not the spirit. <laughs> so, so, um, so you are still using a, a, an Android device, but you're not using it as the way it was intended. The goal behind all of those those types of things, where you can only contribute through a mobile device, is really designed around trying to keep everybody on an even playing field, um, so that people aren't they don't see something that they can't achieve, and then decide that they 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 don't want to play. Um, and so, but we're way past that, and so it's just it's just really. Um, 
I think Instagram just doesn't know what to do with it anymore. Like they, they don't know where to go with it. And it's not that big of a deal because everyone's figured out that they can use Yellow Duck um, to get the uh, RTMP input uh, or there's another company that you can pass it. So anybody who wants to do that is figured out a way to do it. It technically breaks the terms of service, but they're at a point where they've ignored so many. I don't know how many, they, what they can actually do. Um, but uh, but it would allow you to not break the terms of service and still get it into the into Instagram. I think that the thing we've always had trouble with is aspect ratio. That no matter what happens when you go into the Android phone, it just gets mashed up. So I, I, I assume you're working on fixing that. Um, next question. Alex Forney Goldner here on the panel, London, UK. New on Indiegogo, Loop Deck have launched a fundraiser slash pre order for the Loop Deck Live. And I guess it's a customizable streaming console. And he has a link there and says, What do you think, Alex? And so, what this is, is a slightly smaller Loop Deck uh, Live. It's a Loop Deck Live S, uh, which means it has the 15 central. Uh, buttons that you can program and you control uh, streaming or any app that's on your uh, Mac uh, for hardware buttons, but also two uh, volume and the two knobs, which you can program and which are also buttons. So um, essentially it's a kind of $179 uh, price point for these things. So um, uh, at the moment you can get money off if you want to risk an early bird one, it's now um, $120 for the ones that are available. Um, 120 euros, I should say. So what do you think? I uh, I think that they are getting their lunch eaten and their breakfast and their dinner by Stream Deck. <laughs> they, they had to figure out a way to do a, a something like a Stream Deck that was their own, put their own. That's what it looks like for me. The, the cynical side of me is like, wow, we have to compete with something that is just uh, destroying our market because the, the earlier Loop Decks were a little bit more expensive. Um, you know, and so I think that Stream Deck filled a space that they didn't fill very, you know, and, and they're, I think they're trying to get into that. I have to admit, I really like it. Like, like looking at it, it looks really nice. I love the idea that I have a couple uh, pots that I can turn as opposed to just just the buttons. So being able to have volume control or, or something else like that, I'm super interested in um, to, to, to make that work. So I, I think it's actually a really good idea. And I will probably try to buy one because I think that it, I, I like the Stream Deck well enough, but this one looks looks like a really great solution. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with Alex. Uh, the only thing I don't like about them is that their stuff seems very uh, ginchy small, so it's kind of hard to get in there and make adjustments. Uh, that's the only thing that's put me off on it. Next, next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana is back. This time he asks, an interesting question was posed on Twitter. How many NDI sources have you used at once stably for production? His highest so far was nine. One. <laughs> one one is the highest I, that, that is the most ndi successful ndi connections and it wasn't oh super stable so it was it was uh but it was um mostly and i and i've never uh i've never used ndi in production so i'm, I'm probably not the right right person to ask um i played with it but i uh but i don't i don't use it in production uh, mostly because that one was not as stable as I'd like it to be. Uh, no one else seems to. I think you, you asked a non-NDI crowd <laughs> what they think. Uh, next question. Alex Hordy Goldner coming right back from London with Aerie, the huge camera manufacturer, have announced a new camera for movies and TV, which includes their first new sensor for 12 years. Its native resolution is less than 5K. Comments? I go with Alex. So yeah, this is for uh, movies because it's seventy-eight thousand dollars for just the body part of it and the sensor. So it is for real feature films and high-end TV. Um, and the native resolution, the sensor resolution, is four six zero eight wide by three one six four high. So it's the classic four by three. You can put um, any glass you want in front of it to get anamorphic if you like. But it looks like Aria aren't going for more pixels. They're going for, sorry, more sensors. They're going for better sensors. So it's more about a comment of that and uh, where the future of cameras are going for features. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, and the continuing death match between Sony and Aria. Uh, Sony sort of held the ground on low light uh, performance. I was talking to my business partner who's all over this camera, and he says it's going to be the next uh, top of the heap because it's going to have that great color from Aerie and low-light performance. It's got both of those going for it. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. 
I had heard that line, you know, we don't want more pixels, we want better pixels from two or three people who I know who I respect a lot in the area of cinematography. In fact, I think our own Chris Summers back in the day when he was coming to office hours uh, had said something about that. It's not always just adding more and more and more photo sites to something. They have to be the best possible photo sites and they have to feed a system that handles what that sensor is sending out beautifully through all phases. So I think this is going to do really well. Airy is the the top of the heap when it comes to that. I you know I think I've seen a lot more people choose them than red in the higher ends of things. So we'll have to see how it comes out. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, everybody said most of the uh, salient points there. It's their their new color science applied to the, a uh, a larger area sensor so that they get better uh, exposure. You know, you can get lower light levels uh, and lower noise into low light level stuff. And so that's an important thing for gathering with uh, LED lights or, or do a lot less lighting, more naturalistic lighting uh, uh, in a feature film. So I think they're going to make a, a lot of strides here. And I, I've seen demonstrations at SEMPTI on uh, you know comparing uh, 2K resolution to 4K resolution in projection on a full-size you know, big theater screen at Linwood Dunn Theater. And uh, the tests that were shown by a major cinematographer there, you had a lot of trouble telling the difference between the 2K and the 4K, believe it or not, uh, with the quality of the sensor and the quality of the glass. So um, I think they've proven that higher number of pixels doesn't necessarily mean better. It's the quality of those pixels and the amount of uh, uh, contrast ratio that you can deliver is what's more important. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm really excited about this camera, actually. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 there's a couple other things that it looks like it fixes, in, in addition to the fact that it's going to be give better pixels. And the reality is, is that, you know, from a from a logistics perspective, uh, 8K is a, is a disaster. Like, it's just really, I've done a bunch of 8K work, and it's it's pain. You know, like just you can't get it anywhere. You can't put it anywhere. You can't transmit it. You can't, you know, and it looks like that's going to be that way for a little while longer. Um, and so I think that the, that the and when it comes to projection, Courtney's absolutely right now. A lot of us can see the difference between 2K and 4K. I mean, I do a lot of projection and I can see the difference between 2K and 4K really quickly. I cannot generally see the difference between 4k and 8k unless i'm on an led wall so so the um so the on a pro, from a projection perspective if you're looking at cinematic um display i don't think that 8k i think that the the roi on 8k is very low and so i think it makes sense to really focus on it, exactly what Court, what courtney said which is you know the the low light per performance 17 stops of uh of um dynamic range which means you're just going to have a and, and it's already with what I believe, I believe area is the um, the top of the heap when it comes to color science. So they their uh, their color just looks better, you know, than everybody else's. It looks smoother. It's it's a better representation. It's mostly in the knees, the way that they process the the knees of you know above the in the the the, the black knee and the, and the white knee is is just really really well done. And I don't know exactly what they're doing there, but they're doing something great. Um, because it looks really good. Um, it's used in probably seventy percent of the the major feature films that are put out as some some version of an Aerie. Um, the thing that was missing with Aries was the ability to do live output. So I mean, it had live output. It's not that an Aerie couldn't do couldn't do TV, but wow, was it painful? Like if you're doing live TV with an Aerie, um, you were just you know eating the os asphalt all the time. Um, the 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 Venices really stand out in that area where they're just much. They have Sony's pedigree. Of, um, uh, of of being able to manage, uh, you know, being able to shade well and so on and so forth. I haven't seen what the shading options are for the for the for the Aries, but it does look like they focused more on the on the video output pack um, than they had before. So I think this is gonna be really great. I I might try to reach out to those guys and see if they'll come to our stage and show us, uh, let us uh, shoot some stuff. So um, so we'll see if they. Uh, uh, this is a good time to to see if they'll come and let us uh, play with it. So so stay tuned for that. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next. A barrier I see to smartphones dominating media acquisition are a network, uh, the network operators that cling to data limits and overages like MTM and Rwanda. As smartphones become the dominant media creation tools, do you think the operators will adapt? Go ahead, Bill. 
I think they're going to have to. I mean, it's just a different game. I, you know, the comments were made earlier, you can't do this and you can't do that. And yes, that is true. But, I, you know, there are limitations with every camera system and there's limitations with every workflow pipeline. Nothing is perfect. What I've seen in terms of the rapid rate of advancement in phone size sensors and the ecosystem to support that has been so fast that, you know, yeah, nobody who has a bunch of great glass and shoots with cinema cameras is going to say that the iPhone is going to replace that entirely. It's just not for a long time. But who knows what's in the future? Maybe there'll be some equivalent to 32-bit float for visuals at some point with some magical sensor that we know nothing about now. And the whole game changes again, and zoom lenses become not an important thing anymore. We just can't tell what's down the road. And the fact that these are in everybody's pockets are the compelling thing. I, I understand your points, and I think they're valid. But I still think the weight of the future is moving in pocket device for capture way more than it's moving into these high-end systems. I, I, I don't think the data limits really affect the media creation that much, you know, because the, the, there's not that many people streaming it out. So, um, so I think that uh, it, 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 your choice of camera isn't going to be affected by, by those things um, very often. I mean, maybe for live, but, but generally it's not going to... Uh, limit folks and, and definitely the phone if you look at TikTok and YouTube and so on and so forth the phones have really taken over in a lot of places um, to make that work <laughs> it's funny TikTok is, is an interesting puzzle because um, you know pr pretty much everybody I've talked to at TikTok you know, any creator that we've worked with from TikTok is all using one device and that's whatever the newest iPhone is like it's it's you know you, now you see behind the scenes of Android phones there but <laughs> they're getting paid to do that so so the um and being given the phones and everything else because they're trying to break that break into that market which has just been a monolith of um of iphone users in general and so the um at least on the high end the but but even in, in youtube you see people sometimes using their i can see the difference they're using an slr camera but then they show behind the scenes of them showing using a phone so there's become a fashion of using uh the phones like this is all we're using it's it's easy um, and even though that oftentimes they're still using something else. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I've been on professional shoots where they're shooting the main the main video interviews or something with an area Alexa, and then they come time to, okay, now we got to do the piece for social media. They bring right. out the iPhone and shoot yeah. the piece for social media on the iPhone. They've got Alexas right there, it, but it's faster and easier for them to shoot it on the iPhone. They shoot the right aspect ratio, et cetera, it, for, the, for the individuals. It also, you know, and I found that, here's, here's the interesting thing is that I – found myself doing this, which is that I saw something on TikTok that had really short depth of field that looked really, really good. And I assumed that it was an ad and just flew past it <laughs> because I was like, you know, like you're used to a certain look in it, in it. And so there's, it's beyond just the fast turn is that there's a look that the phones have that feels like authentic to the viewer in a way that, that the other ones, sometimes it just, you feel like they're working too hard, you know, and then you, then you move past it. So it's a very interesting puzzle. Uh, next question. Next one, Thomas Phillip in Murray, North Carolina says, what are your favorite iPhone frames and or rigs for video, such as the small rig or the Ulanzi? I'm just going to say ahead of time what Tom said. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> oh, talk about throw the question to me. Uh, <laughs> Small rig. Here you go. Yeah. Uh, iPhone 13 Pro, Loom Cube, lots of quarter 20s, threads on every side. You can mount it on your tripod. Got a handle. Go for it. Yeah, that's great. Good, Bill. First time Alex mentioned it, I went right on and bought yeah. a small rig. And I've got a tripod mount. I've been using it a ton with a monopod uh, and or sometimes the DJI uh, stabilizer. I have the four, I think. An amazing shooting system for just quick run and gun pickups. And the footage looks fabulous. Yeah, I got it from Tom <laughs> and, and, and spread the word. So, uh, so yeah, it's a great, great suggestion. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from James Hutchinson in Dublin, Ireland. If you were to buy into an SLR system today, which one would you purchase? Nikon, Sony, or Canon? What are the pros and cons of each? Go ahead, Tom. Well, I can only talk to one, and that is Canon. I am deeply indebted to Canon. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, a number of lenses. I enjoy the entire system. I've been shooting Canon since the 20D. Wow. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. 
Yeah, I would say uh, either Canon or Nikon. And the reason that I that I I know there are and some people say Nikon. I probably they're probably hating me right now. I I'm a Canon guy. But the thing that I miss when I move away from that and move to the Blackmagic stuff or anything else is that sync flash environment that isn't always necessary. But if you really want to craft images. What you're doing mostly is controlling light. And if you look online at the major still photographers, you will see they're always running uh, either radio triggers or wires out to flashes, and they're crafting the light by allowing the manipulation of the amount, direction, softness, uh, carving up light to put it exactly where they want it to hit to make a photo that is way beyond just point and shoot. And that fascinates me, and I love it when I have time to spend time working on crafting a photo. There's there's a difference between taking a picture and making a picture, and the people who make them fascinate me. Go ahead, Mitchell. Sony, no baloney. <laughs> um, yeah, and and I think that I think the big thing is is that I find that I can use Canon lenses on a wider number of things that I use. So with Black Magic cameras and other things, and so and I've I've owned a little bit of all of those cameras. Um, I used to have almost equal amounts of, of Nikon and, and, and Canon lenses and cameras for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly because I had a show about <laughs> photography, so I felt like I needed to have both. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but I, I think that I, I find that I, I've leaned towards Canon for the last decade, so, so I think that that's where I've gotten most of my lenses. And, that's, and again, it had to do with it. It's a little bit more flexible also with the converters. Um, on the Canon, the Canon mounts um, are easier to convert to other things than the Nikon mounts, in my opinion. Um, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana's back. Workflow is always the question. I have no problem with multiple workflows for different projects. What is your approach to designing workflows for projects? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, lazy, but it's always gathering materials and things uh, before you start uh, doing the production. And the, the gathering requires that you have some planning behind it. But if you don't have all your parts and the pieces ready to go before you start, then you've got problems. Go ahead, Courtney. I am old school, yellow pad and a pencil. Yeah, because <laughs> I even, even in doing complex programming, the first thing I'll do before I even approach a keyboard, I'll sit down and I'll write out the basic steps to the program and, and how I want to organize it and everything on a yellow pad and uh, and then take it from there to start programming it from there. But it always starts out on a yellow pad. Good, Bill. Uh, Alex has mentioned, and I love OmniGraffle for that. I use it all the time for doing simple workflow diagrams that let you do different shapes that represent different things and then connect them. And as you reconfigure and move around, those connections stay or you can move them. I just find it's a, it's a brilliant little idea workflow generator. Yeah, I mean, I think that I... Uh... I definitely try to customize the workflows to what I'm trying to do. And, and, and I work very, I, I guess they call it agile now, but I mean, I've been doing the same thing since I was a kid, which is that I try to very quickly get something specced up and look at it and figure out what worked and didn't work as fast as I can. Um, the, the piece of that, that I, that I add to it is I'm very unceremonious about throwing stuff away. So I get something I, I, when I'm doing the research. Now, the funny thing about me is that once we're in production, I won't change anything. Like I just, I don't want to change anything. I don't want to make anything go. Like I know that I can get from point A to point B without failing and no one's going to pull anything out. And I know that I could do it better next time. <laughs> like, so, so once I'm in the production pipe, I tend not to experiment very much when I'm between the production, I experiment all the time, like nothing is safe, you know, and I, I play with things and I, um, you know, the typical way that I wrote programs when I was a kid, I started writing and I didn't have any training. I just made up a system, which was that I would write a program as fast as I could without any worry about whether it was correct code or not. I'd look at what it put out. I, fi I you know, and then I would, I would always delete all the code. Like I would never keep one line of code. And then I would write it again, a, making an attempt to make it relatively correct. I, I, I draw it out and structure it and, and get it there. And when I finished it, I threw it away again, like not a single line. Like I would throw all the code away. And then I would do what Courtney said, which is that I'd sit there in a flow graph. <laughs> I'd build flow graphs of everything. When I did it, we didn't have OmniGraffle. I had a stencil. <laughs> Like literally I had, I had a stencil of the decision things and I would draw them in and I, and I, and I'd stencil them and I literally by hand would draw the entire program in a decision um, tree 
and but with this little stencil that I that I had, and I have pages and pages of these of these things that that and some some of the big folded out paper of these huge things that I'd figure out. But I did it um, only on the a little bit on the second pass and on the third pass. I was planning to keep that code, <laughs> you know, so there, there was a lot of commenting, there was a lot of process of what I did, and and that's and, and then I built three D models the same way, um, you know, I just do it three times, and the third one I'm really trying to keep. Um, so good, Courtney. Yeah, and I might point out that a spiral notebook. I've stumbled across spiral notebooks when I was writing, uh, you know, designing, you know, uh, hardware for audio circuits and so on, uh, stuff that I built and manufactured. And they're still around. I can still rebuild those. If I could get the parts, I could still rebuild those uh, audio circuits today. Anything that I did only on the computer is gone. I can't read those discs anymore. They're long gone. They're you know they're sitting in the back yeah. of a garage somewhere. But that spiral notebook has a lot of my thoughts and a lot of my designs, and they've existed for fifty years. You know. Yeah, you know, I I I ran across some of them. I was I was looking for something else in my garage, and there's a I have a big box full of these spiral notebooks and moleskin and all kinds of other things that are all sitting there that I used to carry around and write everything in. I almost went back to it. Like I haven't gone back to it yet, but I almost went back to doing it on paper because I realized that there were just all these open thoughts about how I was structuring pixel core and how we would, you know, the business models and the process and the designs. And it was very fascinating to watch the, what I was thinking 20 years ago, which is remarkably the same as what I'm thinking now. But, but it was, um, that it, it, uh, that I know that I I don't have any of that stuff. I mean, I kind of, again, I don't keep a lot of that stuff. And so the digital has made it very uh, um, uh, temporary. You know, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I agree. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. Alex mentioned video and audio updates for developers coming as part of WWDC. I've recently purchased Cubase 12 and have enjoyed working with it. Should I be concerned about not being on the logic train with Apple's rapid upgrade cycle? I will say that Apple has shifted gears on the logic um, train, <laughs> you know. So, so they, they something's gone on. I don't I don't know what they're planning or what they're doing. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of it is around immersive because you know they're going closer and closer to AR and VR, and so I think that we're seeing a lot of the updates that we're seeing in, in Motion, Final Cut, and Logic have been really trying to get the immersive stuff working, and I think that. We'll probably can see a, a con continuation of that. I kind of felt like Apple wasn't doing that much with Logic, and suddenly they just put it into another gear and started releasing things. I don't know enough about Cubase to know whether it's a thing that you want to sit on or not. I mean, I think there's lots of people who seem to like it, but I don't. The projects that I see go by are usually a Ableton Live, Logic, um, uh, Pro Tools, or or occasionally now recently uh, uh, FL Studio. But those are the only things that I see. The, you know, FL, FL Studio is new. The other ones, everything was in one of those three that we that we saw. You know, so now next question. Douglas Carmichael says, Carl's advice to stop buying and start learning is a powerful counterpoint to the mindset of the gear acquisition system, GAS sometimes as it's acronymed. How do you help yourself not succumb to the pull of the marketing department when the new product announcements come? I go ahead, uh, Courtney. Spend all your money so you don't have any money, and that stops you from buying new stuff. <laughs> just buy until you run Otherwise, out of money, and then then it's really easy. No escape. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, I just think about. I try to think back. I think I've been reasonably good, which is to say that I haven't bought things because I thought they were going to be interesting, and then never went back to them. So it sat in a box. I have a few things like that in my life, but not very much. So I think what I've been doing is trying to truly make purchases that solve real problems in the real world. If I run across something I can't do and I need something to be able to do it, and I think there's somebody who will pay me to do that eventually, I think that's a good purchase. Uh, wow, everybody's talking about A, so I should get A, is a pretty bad strategy in my, my book. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, don't worry about those marketing departments. They're not the ones to fear. You got to fear about watching on after hours because, I, or <laughs> even office hours. Here I am with a uh, small little Windows PC because Courtney mentioned it a couple of days ago. So you never know what you're going to find here. Yeah, you know, for me, I, I just have I have a budget. I have a budget every month that I can spend on on stuff, and that's all I do, all I spend. And if, if I don't, if I run under that budget, I have to wait. I can't buy any new things. <laughs> so, so that's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sustainable budget for me to, to be able to buy new things. And I feel free to buy the things inside of that, but, but I start 
pulling in if I start running out of money. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it, uh, Tom points out that gas is contagious. <laughs> it's very <laughs> contagious. Uh, next question. Robin Cutshaw, Atlanta, Georgia, up next. I can have concurrent Zoom logins with Mac and iOS devices, but not two Macs. Are you using more than one Zoom account to get around this? Uh, I have lots of Zoom accounts. So, I mean, the company has a bunch of them. I have three, three Zoom accounts that I use. And the reason I do that is because the, you need, I believe that you need two. Like everybody needs two accounts because when one account is running an event, like for me, if, if after hours is running, I can't use that account to go into another meeting or to create another meeting. So I have another account that is my meeting account that I invite people to meetings um, because that's the only way to get it done. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, that's how we approach that. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael, uh, many African mobile operators like MTM often mo offer mobile payment and services that use the mobile device as the account cutting out banks and card issuers. Could you see that ever taking off in North America, Europe, or Asia and or Asia? Yeah, I would say that's, it's called Apple Pay. <laughs> so so it's a, that's the big version of it. It is, it is interesting uh, when you look at the, um, in Africa, uh, and, and someone's got their mic open. I can hear myself. Um, very, very small. Um, anyway, um, the uh, uh, for in Africa and in much of the emerging world, the only electronic device that many people have is their phone. So that's why this market has built up to such a thing because they don't have a computer. They don't have a you know something else. They don't go to work that has it somewhere. They have a phone, and a lot of a lot of them are actually feature phones. They're not even. Um, you know, a, a typical Android or, or Apple phone. And it is amazing when you're there to see how much can be done with a phone. I mean, people are taking out loans. They're paying for their groceries. They're sending money to each other constantly. They're communicating. It is a, it's an incredible infrastructure that has built up around mobile, um, you know, mobile communication. And it's a really, it's really powerful. And it kind of gives us a it, it, what's interesting is that in a lot of places like that, in the emerging world, it has basically, um, you know, leapfrogged over top of the the West, as far as just much more modern and much more um, uh, elegant way of handling a lot of these things, uh, without having to do that. And it's just it, it has been it's really amazing that the digital phones, especially, have um, revolutionized so many things. I know, and, and personally, I know mostly in Africa is what I'm familiar with, in Asia as well, I'm sure. Um, but in Africa, uh, you know, to give you an example, you're a farmer and you have a small plot of land and you are, someone will, you don't have the money to go to town to sell whatever your plantains or whatever you're, you're cooking, sorghum. Uh, so, so what you do is you, someone comes by and buys it from you, then they take it and then they pack it, they sell it to another person and then they sell it in town. And, it gets, and the price gets marked up a lot every single step of that. And as a farmer there, before the phone, you had no idea how much, what the market rate is. And so you didn't know what they're selling to intent, like what the end cost was. Um, by having a cell phone, it actually gave the farmers the ability to immediately know what the market rate is. Now, and, and, and it gives them a, a, a key, just that information gives them a really important um, negotiating term is that they know what it's worth. Um, that rather than someone buying it at one tenth and then marking it, it might get marked up a hundred times by the time it gets out there. Now they're going to have to give some because, but they know what by the cell phones, they know what all their neighbors are selling it for. They know what everybody else it's, it's a, it, beca it became a transparent system. Um, in addition to that, the farmers could instantly get loans against things that are, they can, they basically started selling futures. Um, so futures are basically the ability to get money for your crop before it, it it's harvested. And it's in the future. And um, and so all of that stuff was empowered by the cell phones, you know, that, that they could actually have that communication and it wasn't all on paper. So it's it's really changed the world. I mean, cha it, it really, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. Go ahead and build. Everything that Alex has said and more, this idea of microloans, micropayments, the fact that you have a digital terminal in your pocket now, as opposed to I have to go to the bank and get some cash for the week. Everything has been transformed. It's going to keep being transformed. That's why we're seeing these blood wars in the uh, uh, Bitcoin and, and 
all the rest of those things that are going to go on because everybody who understands change understands that this is a profound change that we're in the beginning of and that I would imagine if I were to close my eyes and wake up 50 years from now, it will be a much different world than it is right now in terms of how value and money is transferred around. And go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I remember working on a commercial about 10 or 11, 12 years ago uh, that had to do with microtransactions and um, vending machines using a cell phone to uh, uh, initiate a transaction on a vending machine for like a dollar purchase or under a dollar purchase. And they had it all worked out. They had it set up. But the problem was the transaction fees for that one transaction, the microtransactions, cost the banks more to process those and to charge them to an account or accumulate them and charge them to an account than the cost of, you know, than their profit on the soda, et cetera. So it never took off. I don't know if they're going to ever overcome that overhead problem for doing microtransactions. I'm talking about the, uh, you know, not big purchases, but small purchases like you'd get out of a vending machine or, yeah. or anything like that so that you could go to a completely cashless society. Absolutely. Uh, so reason, check out Kiva.org as well. If you, if uh, It's something I, I use a lot to give micro loans to folks. 25 bucks here, 50 bucks there. All right. We are changing subjects uh, and talking about 3D printing. This was a request a while back. Um, we'll see how popular it is uh, as far as going down that path. So if you have questions about 3D printing, we've got a couple of folks here that do some 3D printing and uh, and uh, and think about it a fair bit. Uh, so um, we're here to answer your questions um, um, and uh, and to kind of work through those things. Uh, he, now, Courtney, you have you have a 3D printer. What do you use? I have two 3D printers. I have, are they the uh, same or different? They're pretty much the same. They're the Ender 3. I started with an Ender mm -hmm. 3 regular, and I made some improvements to it. Then I bought an Ender 3 V2, which is the second version. And the current version that's out there now is the Ender 3 S1. And uh, it makes some changes. It's moved the extruder from uh, off on the side of the Y-axis to the uh, right on the Y-axis itself so it can handle TPU and flexible filaments a little bit better. And there's less ringing in the... Uh, in the print uh, stuff, it's a, it's about a hundred bucks more expensive, but I recommend these as a good starter printer for anybody who wants to do regular 3D printing. Uh, it's cheap. You can get a regular Ender 3, not the V2, for under two hundred dollars, maybe one hundred and sixty bucks, delivered free uh, in the United States, uh, free shipping, and uh, they stock them in the United States. Typically, I buy them directly from Creality, uh, the manufacturer, and they have a, uh, maybe it's because I live near a distribution point, but I usually get it within three days uh, of ordering it, and it's Chinese manufactured. But they've been very sturdy, and f the price per for, per for performance, I can't believe that they can sell it for under $200. That, uh, and, and what's the volume that they cover? Uh, it's about 300, uh, 250 by 250 or 220 by 220 by 250, something like that, millimeters. So about eight inches cubed. So right. that kind of a volume, if you think of that as an eight inch cube, uh, anything that you can print in that volume, it can handle. And um, for the price, you know, you, you really can't beat it. It's a great problem solver. I've yeah. used it many, 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 solving many, many problems that I never would be able to solve before without, you know, the expense of hiring a machinist to machine little custom parts to do something simple, you know. Yeah, it was interesting when I, um, when I first started really thinking about it, I was actually at, uh, I was at Hallmark, um, uh, the, the Hallmark Cards. This is when I was really, this is when I had heard about 3D printing and I hadn't, and um, Hallmark, you know, they have an engineering team. I know that it's funny to think about a, a, a greeting card company having an engineering team, but they have an engineering team that's brilliant. I mean, they're incredible electrical, electrical engineers. You know, when you open up the card and it goes, you know, like or whatever, there's somebody who has to figure out how to do that. And this is the team that figures that out. They also figure out things that are added on to it, you know. And so they had at the time, this is back when, when we got started, it was really like the maker printer was the one that everybody seemed to have. And they literally had for all their little things, they had some big resin based ones as well, but they, but on the day-to-day -day basis, they had four of those maker printers and they were running 24 seven. Like they just had, you know, they're, they're just constantly, and, and they literally, they had them batched. You know, so they just take one out and immediately just dropped another one in as soon as you, as soon as you reset it. And they had all these things that they were constantly printing. But what was interesting about it 
and this is when it might it was like an eye opener for me as I was trying to figure out how to print figurines and how to pick, print pictures of people's heads and I came in in the morning we were setting up to do a, do a live stream and one of them had a printer running and it didn't look like a piece of a card or anything else and I said well what is what are you printing there and he says oh it's a piece of pipe it's it's, it's a fitting for a pipe and, and he said I have this I have one pipe at home he goes, and of course I'm telling you all now I'm not gonna name name him because he said don't tell anyone I said this he goes I'm using the printer because I had a I have one pipe that doesn't fit the other pipe very well. And so I just measured it and I just printed this thing. It'll seal them together, you know, with a little glue, it'll seal them together and make it work. And the idea that that was the big aha moment for me was using the 3D printer as this little fix it thing. Not like I'm trying to build something with it that's grand or or something really cool, but I, I need one little thing that just fits into here, or I need another little thing that just fits into there. And I, I find myself, you know, uh, when I print something out, I mean, I do print things that I think are cool, but I, I print, um, and I have a, my, the, the one that I use, I have a weird thing about the 3D printers, which is that the um, open 3D printers makes me, I, I don't know what it is about it. I just always feel like something's going to get in it. it. It never, it hasn't, but I always, so I always buy closed printers. Like I just need them to be in a box. And it's just, it's a weird, I know Courtney doesn't ha have that problem, but I, it, it's some OCD thing for me that an open printer worries me that I'll I don't have cats to... I don't have birds that eat wires cat. or cats that like to hang out on warm things I have a cat so I think that might be but but the uh so anyway so I use the the quiddy or kitty quiddy quiddy q i d i and I'm using the I think it's the x plus which is is considerably more expensive it's 700 dollars to get it it's slightly larger so it'll do a 10 and a half inch by eight inch by eight inch you know box and I have to admit that I've fully utilize that slightly extra <laughs> that real estate where and it something wouldn't fit and a lot, even now when i print things i have to print them at an angle you know to to make those work and so so those are the things that so i but i i do lots of little things and it, remarkably i picked a day to talk about this when i i don't have anything on my desk because the stuff is at the office that i that i printed out um but uh the um, in some box, but I printed out a bunch of stuff for my, my printer. I mean, my, my, uh, um, I printed a bunch of stuff for my switchers back, you know, a while ago. And then I've, I print lots of little things that just fit into things like this doesn't fit quite right. And I measure it. One of the things that I think is a really interesting mix that I've started to play with is, um, 3d scanning along with printing. So I can, you know, using something like polycam, I get actually a very accurate model of what I'm doing. And so what I'll do is I'll, I have some little piece of something that I want to um, fix. I will pull out my phone and scan it. Um, and then I will model it, you know, in, I use Cinema 4D because it's just what I know. You can use, you can absolutely use Blender to do this. Um, uh, you know, but I, I use Cinema uh, to, to build models. And so I'll build a model of it based on the scan. Um, and then, you know, just a rough model of it. And then I print it and I make sure that it's exactly the same as, as what I, you know, the scale. Because the, 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 with the LiDAR on the iPhone, you get scale as well. Now I have, now I have something to build around and I'll build, I'll build something. And usually I build a test. Like here is a, um, you know, I'll build like a little ring and just make sure the ring is snug. Like, and then I know, okay, okay, now I'm, because the one thing about 3D printing is it's a commitment in time. Like when you start printing something complicated, it takes hours. I mean, I saw in the prints that I do take, you know, anywhere from two hours to all night, you know, to print. So I do lots of little tests that aren't going to take very long to print. So it'll be like a really thin little thing that just lets me test scale, make sure that it's the fit is right. Um, uh, one of the things that I found, like for instance, the A10 printers, you can go up to, uh, I can't remember where I downloaded it, but I, I download, people build models of the A10 printers. Um, and uh, I just bought it. Look, I'm, look, I'm looking to try to model it. I just bought the A10 printer model. I built a little piece for it that just let me test, like, it looks like it's snug on the 3D model. Is it snug on the A10? And once you, once you know that your A10 switcher in your 3D program is accurate and you've tested it and you know that the scale is just right, now anything you build in the 3D, in the 3D space is going to fit on that, on that, uh, um, on that printer. But when I go into like development mode, my printer's running, you know, all the time. I mean, I, I can't say that I'm printing all day for, but for weeks I'll be like, I have some idea and I'll be and the printer will be sitting there running, you know, 24 seven. Cause I just keep on, I'm, I'm building different parts. So I'm build, building different um, ideas. Um, so I think that, that the, uh, uh, it's a really powerful, 
uh, tool um, that that I would highly recommend. I, and I think Courtney's right, probably the ender if you don't have cats. <laughs> I can tell you why my cat gets into everything. So the idea of an open uh, printer, you know, my my current printer is closed and in a room that I can close the door <laughs> so that so that it's out it's out of the way to keep it away from the cat. Um, all right, uh, let's let's jump into your questions. Chris Widener has a start off here from Lafayette, Indiana. Metal 3D printer or CNC machine, which is better to prototype with? Uh, I would not buy uh, the, the cost of a metal 3D printer is, is so high um, that I wouldn't I wouldn't bother um, with that. There is a comp uh, what's the company that um, there's a company that you can mail it out to if you want to do something like that. I just can't think of the um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's a uh, uh, three. That I ha I used before I I use this and it's been been so long now that I have solid it. Solid uh, works or something like that. No, it's a it's a um, uh, Shapeways. So Shapeways is the company that I've used in the past to build stuff. And so the big thing is is that a lot of you know in the past I've I've used this where I'm trying to figure something out, but they can print in resin. They they have you know so basically you're paying someone who has. It's like a gym membership. You know, you can have your own gym, home gym, but you're probably not going to buy the kind of equipment that the, as at the big gym um, because lots of people are using it. And so uh, in the same way that Shapeways can produce very high resolution models, um, they can produce metal, they can produce a lot of other things there. And so you're better off on a really heavy um, development is to, is to if you're going to do 3D printing. Uh, I think CNC is, is a different puzzle and you have to decide how many dimensions that the cnc is going to be capable of doing um so those uh those cnc mills can you know they can get they start off relatively inexpensive <laughs> a couple thousand dollars um but the the ones that i know that um uh, i have some i have uh some family members that, that do a lot of cnc and those ones are between quarter million and a half million dollars each um, but they're doing five, I think it's five, I want to say five axes, which doesn't make any sense to me. But yeah, they, um, anyway, so they, they can, um, these are really complex uh, printer um, CNC mills. So you have to decide what those, again, how many dimensions you need to manage on that CNC um, uh, to, to make that work. The CNC is a subtractive process as opposed to an uh, additive process. One of the advantages of it is the integrity of the CNC mill will be, the, the integrity of the final part on a CNC will be will be much higher than a printed part. So a printed part is adding layers to things that are there, and it by its nature it's not continuous, um, and so it's never going to be as uh, almost never going to be as strong as um, something that you're going to get out of a CNC mill because a CNC mill is a piece of metal or wood, um, you know, in in some cases, but it's it's a continuous piece that you're cutting out of, um, so the integrity will be higher. So you just want to look at what you're trying to build. Um, I know that uh, we almost, in my last company, we almost bought a shop bot, uh, which is a CNC for wood. I mean, you can do a couple of other things with it, but it, the big thing is, is that it can go deep. I think it can go, I think it can go an inch, inch and a half deep, and it can cover a four by eight sheet of wood. Now, you be like, why is it four by eight? Well, a lot of sheets of wood that you buy are four by eight if you go to the, if you go to the hardware store. So it can take that whole sheet of wood and route it and where that's used just to kind of um to expand a little bit is um there's a lot of companies we work with big the the really big companies that do rental they have all these rolling cases that roll in and they they're not they don't have all the metal and everything else all the ones that we buy the road cases that we buy they're actually all wood and they have this very intricate um leaving process that almost looks like japanese le uh, leaving that goes into the into the edge there and they're all, there's almost no metal on them. There's the, the there is the hinges, the latch, and the and the and the um, uh, wheels. And the interesting thing there is that I, I talked to someone about it, and they said, "Well, metal is expensive, and it takes a long time to put it on." I was like, "Well, how do you you got this intricate weave? Like, how long did it take?" And he goes, it's "Shop bot." It just it, like literally we print the cases, <laughs> like you know, like we print like they have a design for their cases, and they literally have this this. It's about a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar router, and it just sits there and just cuts all the pieces, and they just it just there's and they literally have someone they're paying not a ton of money to just drop more wood into it, and they print out the pieces, and it, I guess it's constantly running, like it's just constantly making more cases, and the cost of the cases, and the cost of the shop bot is expensive twenty grand or whatever but the cost of the cases is nothing 
you know, like it's just, it's just wood and, and wheels, you know? And so, so there's, um, that's another thing to think about as far as those CNC is another, it's kind of the subtractive version of, of 3d printing. And, uh, it's a wondrous thing as well. Um, I have a, in my bucket list, I have a, I have a shop in my head that will have both CNC and, uh, printers. Uh, next question. Danny Law in Malaysia up next here on the panel. Which type of 3D printer is recommended for printing out trays to mount between a 19-inch rack or mini trays to mount power bricks on? I right, go, ahead, Courtney. Well, you can do the mini trays on an Ender 3. The problem is if you're going to try and print stuff that goes into a 19-inch rack is the 19-inch dimension because most uh, consumer-type 3D printers don't have dimensions of that large, with the exception of this uh, Creality uh, CR30. And this has an infinite Z-axis because it, it works at a 45 degree angle and on a belt. So the Z-axis is on a belt that sits at a 45 degree ang axis and it just, uh, it, it wrote it, uh, the belt moves as it prints. And so you can print uh, something that's five feet long and 10 inches wide on that printer. Uh, if you want, because it just comes off the end of the belt as the belt moves, it keeps printing and it prints at a 45 degree angle. So uh, as it moves, it, it keeps printing. And so you've got a, a limited height, but an infinite length. And it's also good for printing multiple things that are, uh, you know, if you want to set it up to print a thousand little widgets, you can set it up, start it, walk away and put a box underneath the end of it. And they'll roll off the belt at the end and uh, keep printing. As long as you don't run out of filament. Yeah, the uh, the hard part really with printing anything, the thing you have to be careful of is printing anything flat that's any bigger than about five inches, <laughs> in my opinion. Like you have to really think about that. One of the things that we got into printing at Pixelcore was teleprompters. <laughs> so so the um, so we we printed these. We we use Lilliputs, and the Lilliput has a um, a feature which is that it's got quarter. One of the Lilliputs has quarter twenties on uh, either four sides or three sides. And so what we did is we printed um, a, uh, if you think about it as a, um, this is like a flat panel. We printed it with a groove that went like this. Um, and it had a, and then it, it printed a little lower down here so that we could, we could literally attach it to either side of the lily put. And then we could just slide a piece of, of glass in here um to make that work and and then it was like a little and then it had here and we put the little webcam in here and and then you were done you know and so and the cool cool thing was is it fit into a little pack that we could put in our like literally with the monitor you could put it into a, like a little pack that just sat in your backpack and you pull it out and it's like this little teleprompter um that that worked the problem we really had with this this design and i think if i remember correctly it was like seven inches by seven inches or something like that um but the big problem that we had with it is that it would warp you know, as we printed it. So building the structure, and basically one of the things about printing is you don't print things solidly because I would use a lot of um, stuff. So if you think about the, if you get close up to it, you're really printing, there's some kind of lattice inside that the printer's making um, that gives it rigid, rigid, rigidity. Um, and you can design what kind of lattice. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out which lattice would make the most sense. I don't remember. I think it was like a triangle lattice that we ended up with, but, um, but the, but it was, but this, the, this flat area, it was, it was really easy to design quickly, but it then took weeks to get it to not to print it without it warping. Um, and so that was really the, the challenge that we have. So, so with the 19 inch style rack, it's the long <laughs> spread is something I would rather probably build two two things like print two things on either side that i bought something that i could span um but even then it won't you know it won't hold much you know a, a typical um uh printed piece won't hold much weight um in that in that area and if i was doing a shelf i'd probably buy one because they're so cheap <laughs> like, like printing print the the materials of printing it might be higher go ahead courtney i found you can hold a pretty good amount of weight but um uh, you got to worry about it. the dimension in which you print the direction, in which you print is important because layer, you know, the, uh, here's a, a vase amount that I printed. This is out of carbon fiber, uh, embedded PLA. And as you can see it, it, you know, it has a rosette mount on it here. I can get in and focus here near my face. So it, uh, it can stick at any one of these angles, but it can hold a pretty good amount of weight, uh, without it slipping. And uh, 
believe it or not, this is, seems pretty lightweight, but it'll hold up to a 20, 20 inch monitor uh, without any problem. But like you say, the warping problem, if you get, um, you have to have a, a print surface that's heated, of course, and it's better to have an environment that's heated because even if the print surface is heated, once you get too thick on your bottom plate here, it starts to cool down and it'll start to pull away from the uh, base plate. Once it starts to pull away from the base plate or curl up a little bit, uh, then you're going to have a problem that print's going to fail or you're going to end up something that's not completely flat on the side of it. Uh, so if you have an enclosed printer like the one that Alex has, you can keep the temperature more constant inside the enclosure. Uh, and some people actually put heaters and thermostats in there to keep them at a constant temperature. And that'll keep the uh, plastic from warping if you keep it near a uh, higher temperature while you're printing. Next question. Mike Beardmore is up next from reading in the UK. He says, how do you store your FDM filament and how long is its shelf life? I have to admit that I, I just keep it in the room that it's in and I haven't had any issue with it, but I don't, I, I think I use it enough that I don't know exactly how long it would last um, there. I, I, I've had a couple there for a year or two on some of the stuff that I don't use very often. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, for PLA filament, I just keep it on a shelf. I built some racks on a shelf. I can just slot them in, into a, uh, a rack that, with two pieces of wood that hold, hold the reels in the complete open. But for um, TPU filament and for some of the uh, nylon filament is hygroscopic, uh, it'll start absorbing water out of the air very quickly, even over a amount of an hour or so. And once it absorbs water, then when you try and 3D print it, it uh, bubbles as it hits the uh, extruder. And the bubbles, of course, ruin your accuracy and makes little holes in your print and so on. So you don't want that. So you got to keep it dry. So what I do is I use those buckle type uh, bins that we sh showed earlier in the hour, uh, which are, are made from iris. And then I have a, uh, I found a round uh, dehumidifier that's electric and it fits inside inside one of those buckle top uh, iris containers. And I keep all my uh, filament that's subject to contamination from water inside those with that internal dehumidifier. And it keeps the humidity down to about 20% uh, inside that all the time so that uh, I can just pull that out and uh, put it up there. And if it's long as it's not a more than a couple of hours of print, it'll be fine. And I'll stick it back and it'll dehumidify it and pull the, pull the water right out of the filament again. And, uh, keep it stored that way. But the rest of it, PLA, I think you can just keep on a shelf. It, it may get brittle. It may dry out after a period of time because it is not hygroscopic. And uh, if once it dries out, it gets brittle and you got to worry about the filament breaking before it gets into the extruder. But that's about the only problem I've run into. Next question. Next one comes to us from David Brady in New York City. Our friend, has anyone ever visited or printed a Doob figurine, D-O-O-B? I was hoping to print mini-me's for family gifts, but it looks like they're out of business. Is there any similar service out there? <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh... David Brady on everybody's desk. I, I want one of those. Like David, if you if you if you actually figure this out, I expect I, I expect a figurine. Um, the uh, I, I don't know where else to get the figurines. I, I will say that one thing that is a is a booming business is bobbleheads. So you can there are like twenty services that will make custom bobbleheads for you. Um, and uh, I, I the funny thing is is that some of them are three D printed. Other ones are actually handmade from the photographs in china like they there's people who there's crafts people who actually are making those uh you know by by hand and i've there's some uh there's some time lapses on uh on tiktok about people the, the crafts people it's amazing to watch them go like it is it's someone who does this all day they'll take a photo and they'll just They'll carve it out in, I mean, I, I, the time lapse makes it hard to understand, but it doesn't look like it's a very long time that it takes them to, to reproduce a person uh, in a relatively good way very, very fast. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was actually going to ask about you. I think you were just addressing it. How do you dollify the person from whatever you have of them it's really into just a the three-dimensional figure? So it's you pick the, from most of these, whether it's a bobblehead or it's a, they have different bodies and you simply, um, uh, you're really re reproducing the head. So you, you get to pick the body and then you put a new head on it and then you hit print. Um, the, 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 I don't, yeah, again, I don't know. 
I mean, there I are those photo Duke. manipulation things like uh, voila artists and things like that that will put you know that will make your your photo into a caricature. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's a 3D version of that that might that'd yeah, be I haven't interesting. Seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, you know the the there's a one of the things um, is that there's a uh, uh, there's a rumor that uh, that MetaShape or not MetaShape but um, that MetaHuman that can actually generate a very realistic version of you from a photograph or from a handful of photographs, Ooh. and that they just don't want to release it because <laughs> suddenly build a whole bunch of digital people that look very much like actors or or other things like that. But there's there's a rumor that's floating around. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, there I, I did uh, give a gift to my uh, a sister and brother-in-law that was uh, uh, you give a you send them a photograph like a portrait a photograph and they would digitize it and put it on basically a, a 3D mannequin and uh, wrap that photo around the 3D mannequin and then they would laser etch that inside a glass cube. So I imagine something similar to that could be done for the, to do the dube thing and just reduce it in size so that you don't have to actually 3D scan your entire family. So you could just submit a photograph and it would wrap that photograph uh, are using photogrammetry to determine, you know, the basic 3D shape of the head. Sometimes the heads come out a little squashed looking, so that is a problem. Yeah, it does look, I mean, Dube looks really cool, I have to admit. It does look like they got some funding and they got a bunch of PR and then they just weren't able to turn the corner. <laughs> like that's, that's, the, that's the story behind that website, in my opinion. Now, next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. Douglas says, for libraries and other public venues with 3D printers, are there tools to track and account for the costs of each print and bill end users? Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Well, whenever you uh, slice something, and a slicer is the software that takes your 3D design and prepares it for the, and converts it to code that the 3D printer understands. It basically slices it into horizontal slices. And I use Cura as a slicer, and the slicer will tell you once you slice an object and you determine the amount of infill, which is the, uh, as Alex described, is the lattice work that's the interior of a solid looking object. It's usually they're never solid. Um, you just have infill and because that can be very complex in there you don't have to unlike injection molding where you have to get it out of a mold it can have a complex interior structure because uh, there can be air gaps in there that you have to worry about getting the plastic out of uh, so um, once you design it and slice it the slicer will tell you the exact number of grams of filament that that will take to print that uh, it's pretty close. It's within about, you know, 1% or 2% uh, and the length of the filament and the amount of weight of the filament. And they sell filament by weight. So it's very easy to calculate the cost uh, other than the time, the actual cost of the materials. And then you have to, you know, estimate, you know, how much you want to get in time for printing something out because prints can take up to 8, 10, 12, 15 hours to print depending upon the size and the complexity of them. And uh, I was going to show the, um, this is the, let's see, this is the, uh, so this is my, um, this is the, the kitty or quitty, um, just to give you a sense of what it looks like. So you have, this is the material. I can choose different materials that I, that I may want to print with. Um, and then I have, you know, basically the configuration of, of it, the layer height, the infill, um, these are the, you know, some, some of the densities here, um, how fast I want the tra the print speed and travel speed to be, um, which can affect, you know, issues, um, uh, around, uh, and then you have uh, the heat. So all of this stuff is saved into, uh, you know, it's, it's in that calculation here. And then if I, you know, click on this, there's a lot <laughs> I, can, I can turn on and off, um, to make this work. And, and I find this, this is on my Mac and it works on Mac and PC. And what it'll do is it, when I'm done with this, when I, you know, it will, um, uh, it will prepare. Let's see if I, I don't know. Um, and then it then I can save to a file, and so it slices it up, and I can uh, save to you know save out to a file, and that file I just simply load on I can USB stick. The my printer actually works on the network. I just don't want to bother, so I I just put it on. A, I I find it easier for me to manage if I just have it on a 3D stick. And so I just put on a USB, I have a little USB stick that is the printer stick. <laughs> I, put things, I put things on it and it keeps track of, it also helps me keep track of where my prints are because they're all on that little stick. I mean, I have them saved other places too, but but it's I, I, I can go back very quickly in the printer and grab them. So anyway, that's what the slicer looks like. Um, and it will take 
pretty much anything. This one's actually pretty robust. It used to be that we had to export all of our models as watertight, which meant there was no holes in them or anything else. This printer will just figure it out. Like it's not, like I still build them watertight because I'm used to it, but I've done ones where I threw it, I just threw it kind of a, a model that was close that didn't have fine formed edges and it still printed well. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, next, next. Did you have something to show, Courtney? Uh, no, that's right. I was just showing a vase watertight, but it, in vase oh, mode, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> and that's with a copper type filament, uh, which is plastic, but it has uh, the sheen. It looks like right. it actually printed out of copper metal. That's cool. That's a, that's now, did you, did you model that? Uh, I took a basic model and twisted it around a little bit to make it a little more creative and, uh, yeah. and printed it. So it's a that's nice great. little base. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, next question. Darius Dunlop in Half Moon Bay, California. Is everyone using extrusion printers? Is anyone using resin printers? Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I opted out of the resin printers because you can get, you know, for the people that are into D and D and printing little figurines with a lot of detail on them that they want to hand paint or little uh, used to be ten soldiers, but now they're printing little uh, uh, artifacts to use in their gameplay and so on that represent their their characters and gameplay. A lot of those. Uh, those uses are very popular with the uh, uh, resin printers. The problem is the resin stinks. It requires post-processing. So when you're done printing, you got to take it out. You got to remove it and it's gooey and you got to put it into an alcohol bath to clean the remaining resin off of it. Then you got to UV seal it. So uh, exposed to UV light to completely harden it. So it requires a lot more uh, messing around. Plus, they're not don't have as big a build capacity. They're usually most of the resin printers, at least the entry level resin printers, are based off a uh, cell phone LCD in the bottom of the printer that exposes uh, it has a UV backlight on it and it exposes the resin one layer at a time, all the whole entire layer at a time, uh, and then it raises up and exposes the next layer and then it raises up and so on. So your print hangs down from above um, and you're also more limited in the, the types of uh, uh, things you can print out of. I mean, it's, the resin is resin and you can go transparent or non-transparent, but that's about your only choice with uh, FDM, uh, which is the filament type of printing. You can go with, you know, carbon fiber, you can go with nylon, you can go with ABS, you can go with uh, TPU, which is completely flexible. Um, here's an example of uh, a holder that I built for my little uh, screwdriver that sits on my bench. And this is printed out of TPU, so it's flexible so that uh, it's not going to break. Uh, the TPU is very strong and, uh, and flexible, so I can fit the little uh, bits into there. And uh, the demagnetizing thing fits into there, and this holds it nicely on my workbench. But you can't... Uh, I don't think you can do flexible, uh, flexible uh, uh, stuff with a resin printer. It's just much more difficult. Yeah, I, I will say one of the things that's happened with resin printers is they become a lot less expensive. So, um, and that has to do with the patents. <laughs> so, you know, all the whole three D printing industry blew up when the when the extruder patents ran out. Um, that was, I mean, that was the big thing that was holding everything up. And then resin ran out a couple years ago, and the whole thing has gone from being you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to hundreds and hundreds of dollars for, for uh, resin printers as well. So as those technologies that were, you know, figured out in the early 2000s or, or, or earlier in the late 1990s, um, those are now becoming much more widely available because of the patents not being applicable anymore, and which is exactly how the patent process was designed to work, <laughs> which was that which was that will protect you for a certain amount of time and then, and then we'll make it more open to everyone. And so, uh, so anyway, so I think that I'm, I'm really interested in a resin prison printer because I like the, the idea of being able to print little things that are very pretty. I, I, I have a friend that has a resin printer and it, it's, uh, when they print stuff out, the level of detail, the, you go back to your filament printer and you're like, mm. <laughs> like, like, it's like, it's okay. Um, but, uh, I haven't, I haven't invested in it yet. Um, next question. JHB in New York says, what's the best software for 3D printers to get started with designing and building small parts? Now go ahead, Courtney. Please excuse if you can hear it. The, uh, the gardeners are here and they're just going crazy. So I'll try and stay close to the microphone. If you can still hear me. And I'm... We can. We can still hear you. Okay, good. Uh, well, what I use is uh, uh, Tinkercad. And, and 
This is my Tinkercad from Autodesk. It's uh, free, it's online, it's browser-based, and you can see all these little parts that I've designed here. Uh, and it's a great 3D design uh, program. This is a base for a, uh, a uh, tally light uh, for a camera that I built. Uh, so once you start it, uh, this is basically it. Uh, and you can design and you just take your basic uh, 3D shapes over here, your primitives, and you drag them out on, onto your design surface. You scale them. And it has very accurate, uh, uh, very accurate, measurements. If uh, you click on that, you want it to be, you know, 42.34 millimeters wide. And when you print it out, it'll be 42.32 millimeters wide. So um, this is, uh, this software is free. It maintains all of your work uh, online so that you can uh, go back to something you designed a, you know, a year or two years ago and uh, uh, keep it and, and go back to uh, redesigning it you know, a year and a half later and all your designs are still there and stored online. Yeah. Uh, next question is related. So I'll jump, I'll answer the next one or, or, or we'll both answer it. Uh, go ahead. Uh, next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, what modeling tools would work best for these new, for those new to modeling for printing? Would Cinema 4D work or would Blender be better? So I think the Tinkercad, I agree with the uh, Courtney, the Tinkercad's the place to start. You know, like you can, th if you want to get fast input, a fast output, get it working. Here's why I use cinema is that um, I've modeled for uh, almost 20 years now. Um, and the hardest part for me with modeling is remembering all the keystrokes. So to model quickly, you have to model, you have to get to a point where you can use all the keystrokes. You cannot use them. If you, if you use the menu on a, on it, like to do really complex modeling, you're dead, dead in the water. Like it'll take you 10 times or a hundred times fat longer to, to model something. And so, and I've, I, so I haven't changed very often. And the reason I do that is because I want to, even if I'm building something simple, I build it in cinema because that's what I use for other things. And I don't want to, I don't want to try to cross learn. Um, and I know that I'd probably learn more if I was using Maya or using Blender and I open Blender every once in a while and play with it and then I go back, but it's, you know, and I, I want to use it because I want to, <laughs> I don't want to buy another copy of cinema 40 for my son, but, but, um, but the, uh, so I, I, I look at Blender, but the bottom line is, is that cinema's tool, modeling tools are exceptional. And they are, um, I think that the only thing that I find more fluid than cinema is, is Modo, but, I, but Modo is not a complete package in my opinion. And so cinema as a complete package, I think that, I think that Cinema 4D at this point is the most complete package. It's, it's not the best for everything. When you're in a huge production pipeline, Maya is better. When you're doing very specialized high-end stuff, I think that that um, Houdini is better. When you're doing photogram, you know, there's all these things that are better at their specific things than cinema. But as one whole package, I think it's the best package out there. And and so the um, uh, so I don't want to learn something else. Like and if I'm going to build capacity, my my uh, my wife and I had this this discussion because she 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 edits a lot, but she um, audio. And uh, I was like, you should just use uh, Logic. <laughs> like, we have a copy, you know? So, so I'm like, we should use Logic. And my argument for using Logic was mostly that it was, uh, that uh, if you're gonna do something for hours and hours and hours, you should it should be the thing you're gonna use forever. As opposed, you know, so go through the, the learning curve uh, of learning the hard thing so that you can be good at it for a long period of time. So, so anyway, so that, that's the, that, that's why I use cinema. But I think that if you're just getting into it, you don't know if you're going to do more of it. I think that Tinkercad would be great. I think that behind that, I would say, you know, after you've gotten past Tinkercad or you want to do something else, Blender is a great free option. But if you're going to say, I'm going to do 3D and I want to commit to something for the next five years, and it's going to need to grow with me all the way up to doing photo real work, uh, I'd be tempted to say cinema. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I agree. If you're you're trying to do something that's going to cross over in from the real world into the uh, 3D uh, computer animation space, you know, you definitely would want to use Cinema 4D or some uh, one of the other uh, things, one of the other 3D uh, generation tools. Tinkercad, I had to get used to. I had been using the other like Cinema 4D and the other 3D generation tools that are algorithmic for generating uh, 3D shapes, and you have to kind of get used to Tinkercad because Tinkercad. Is uh, starts with solids, and to to create negative space, you have to kind of create a uh, a negative shape. You know, yeah, you have to create a uh, uh, a solid shape. Yeah, 
that that removes data. So you have to uh, get used to designing things by ma making a shape and then making another shape and make that uh, uh, a hole and basically a 3D hole that you move into the 3D shape to carve out certain sections. So it's it's a completely different uh, train of thought as far as creating it. Whereas in 4D, you'd maybe start with a 2D shape and extrude it um, to generate your basic 3D shapes. Uh, using extrusion and other algorithmic, uh, you know, yeah, spline curves and et cetera it, to generate specific shapes. So. That's funny. You know, the, um, the, I, I find that Cinema 4D wants, the thing it wants to do the most is sub subdivision surfaces. <laughs> you know, like it, it, it does the other things, but it, I find that it, it, it's easier to use sub Ds. The, the, um, uh, the Boolean functions that, that Courtney were talking about is something that I did a lot of when I was in using Form Z because it did Booleans very, you know, exceptionally well. But uh, you're basically adding, like, I'm going to take these two objects and add them together. And then it gets rid of the, the, the stuff in, in the middle and just keeps the surface. Um, or you might subtract it or you might do intersect, you know, where just where these things cross over, I want that object. And it, it, it's a little bit of getting your head around it. But once you get your head around it, it's pretty easy to think about negative space to, to make that work. Um, next question. Next one comes from James Babbitt here in San Diego. And he says, well, would you add an enclosure to a 3D printer? And would the enclosure change the temperature and or affect the output of the printer? Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yes, there are a couple of reasons to, to enclose a 3D printer. One is the smell. Uh, it would, uh, if you want, if you're printing smelly, ABS is kind of smelly and nylon can be smelly and, and um uh, Certain types of uh, hydro, high hydrocarbon plastics can be smelly and toxic. So if you want to have <laughs> that, a, smelly that and toxic, toxic thing. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's the, the lead, whole, Courtney. Yeah. Might kill you uh, is, 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 is an important yeah, piece Yeah, you of the want puzzle. to be careful with, with the, if you're heating up plastic, uh, they, some of them can generate, uh, PLA is, is non, I don't have any smell coming out of the PLA. I don't smell mine at all. ABS is a problem and nylon is a problem. And uh, besides keeping it at a constant temperature is evacuating the fumes from it. Also, yeah, they, they don't have evacuation of the fumes in a, in a, um, a liquid type printer, you know, a resin printer, but that can get smelly. That can smell up an entire house very quickly. So you want to have something to suck the fumes through a hose to outside of the building. Uh, if you're going to enclose something and it allow you to print, um, uh, more stiff plastics, more practical plastics that that uh, can hold up and be used in practical applications and high temperature plastics and so on. Next question. Next one comes to us from Roger Miles in uh, Lake Zurich, Illinois. He says, is there a recommendation for a printer and template site to make Lego parts? I, I shouldn't have joked you know, about that, but I've stepped I on so many. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about how many... Um, uh, I don't know about templates, although I, it wouldn't be very hard to build them. You know, this is where you start testing things and see, you know, if you look at what, what you have with the Legos, um, it would be pretty easy to start building a template yourself. Um, I don't know of where you'd get it. I, this is a place where I think resin would do you better than, uh, would do better than, than PLA because it's a really fine fit to get it just to work. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, the, the open source place to do that is Thingiverse. And I've posted a lot of my designs on Thingiverse, which is a uh, open source community where you post your your designs and anybody can download them and use them. And I believe there are like Lego has fallen out of patent. And so it is now uh, uh, open source to some degree. So you can get uh, Lego compatibles. You can't call them Lego. So they still have their trademark, but their patent on the design of the blocks has run out. So you can uh, you can probably find them on uh, Thingiverse and download the model and you know size them up to any size you want. Of course, you have to be consistent since they lock together. Once you choose a size for them, you have to stick with that amount of scaling of that model so that all your blocks will fit together. But yeah, there shouldn't be any reason why you shouldn't be able to do that in any color, in a rainbow of colors. I have to admit, I, I had never thought of printing custom Lego parts until this question, and now I'm I'm already obsessed with it in my mind. <laughs> I'm just already like, like, oh, this would be really fun to build like custom Lego parts to build your own, you know, Lego ships and stuff like that. It's a really cool idea. Good, Bill. To take it one step farther, they don't make any filaments that are edible, do they? That'd be great to be able to make edible Lego castles. Well, they, they, I don't know about that, but they, they definitely make um, edible printers. They, there's, there are printers that will print in food, like you know, yeah, like cake, it, it, print printers. 
yeah and and um and those those are pretty pretty amazing go ahead courtney what are you showing there oh these are these <laughs> yeah are... these are lego this is on thingiverse so here's a little lego boats look there's a right. there's a simpson character and they you put a little uh, balloon on here and it blows the air out the back of the boat and uh, you can stack the bricks so uh, balloon boat three is right there on the maker bots thingiverse ink edibles cake pro uh direct to cake printer <laughs> <I'm> sorry <but laughs> there you go oh that i, I don't know I, i'm not gonna buy that in, in in the term of gas i'm not gonna i'm not gonna buy a, a cake printer but i, still, I think I a lot of one. bakeries have those to put like uh, birthday pictures on the cake they can print a layer on top of the icing i don't know if they can print the whole the whole no, cake. no yeah i think they they print it they, they print the yeah they print it on top and uh it's but it's it's a really there's there, there's all kinds of uh food printers that are coming uh, but obviously the quality is all over the place at the moment we're still that's it's still wild wild west uh, for for food um uh, go ahead next question next question from danny law in malaysia how tedious is it to clean up after a print job if it is uh, go ahead courtney if you're using an fdm printer not at all you just take a, a, a putty knife and you pry it loose from the base and put it to work uh, sometimes if if you have some stringing or something if your printer is not tuned correctly you just use a, a base a piece of uh, i mean a, a flush cutters like diagonal cutters to cut little strings off or use a heat gun to uh, uh, if they're very fine threads, sometimes uh, some filament, if it's not, if your extruder is not adjusted correctly, as it moves from one place to other, another place, it'll leave like a spider web size thread between the two spots. And you can just hit it with a heat gun and those will melt away uh, quickly. So as far as FDM, that's all the prep that it takes. Uh, the resin printer, like I described earlier, you got to, you know, clean it with that, put in an alcohol bath, isopropyl alcohol, 90%. You got to swish it around in there for quite a bit of time. Then you got to put it in front of a, either out in the sunlight for several hours or into an UV curing station that will uh, rotate it around and expose it to uh, UVC type light, or not UVC, but UV light to uh, cure the plastic completely. But uh, that's why I like the FDM. Once it, once the printer stops and the printhead moves away from it, it's ready to use. I just want to point out chalk edge chalk creator v2 plus it prints in chocolate chocolate that's all i'm saying Go ahead, courtney yeah i did I, there is some prep if you have supports that i forget to mention i try and print all my print i try and design all my prints to print without supports supports are the places if you've got a 3d print that has overhangs that you can't obviously print extrude uh, filament over thin air it has to have something to hold it up. Uh, so they, uh, the slicer will design supports that it prints from the base up to the point that overhangs uh, so that it can print on something and that it's designed with just little nibs that attach uh, to the overhanging part. And so you have to remove the support after it comes off. And you do that with a pair of uh, flush cutters. Uh, or a lot of times you just break them off. Uh, if there's stiff enough plastic, you can just break them off. Yeah, I have a tendency to be, when I have something complex that has overhangs, I, it does produce a lot of lattice. It can produce a lot of lattice. And you can kind of grab onto it at first. And then I end up using some kind of X-Acto knife to kind of you know trim trim off those things. And usually I do it well. I find doing it, listening to a good book <laughs> so for some of the complex ones, the one that I think Dennis had up there for a second, things with lots of negative space can take a long time to to um, pull the lattice out. So I, I will say that it does get tedious if you build something with a ton of negative but exterior space um, that you have to get to. Uh, I have had I've had some that I clean up in a couple minutes, and some that I've literally taken an hour and a half to get every little bit out of out of that. So it is a is a little bit of a thing. Yeah, that that is that I look at that and go, well, that'd be a lot of work. But it's all chocolate. <laughs> it's all chocolate. Is that that's, chocolate? Is that a chocolate, chocolate print? Yeah, I'm reading. No, chocolate I was looking 3D at it. printers can create more intricate shades. Oh, okay, I was I was looking at that like that would take a lot to clean up if I was doing it with PLA. But but out of chocolate, yeah. Yeah, yeah cleaning it up is tasty. 
Yeah, exactly. But yeah, that one looks to... like it's a uh, has. If you go less than forty five degrees for an overhang, you can usually do it without supports. No, oh, yeah. Get more than forty five degrees, you're going to have to have supports. But that looked like that lattice looked like all the all the angles were less than forty five degrees in the overhang. So it'll probably print without out supports. You can eat it probably. right away, right off the bat. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, next question, Darius Dunlap, Half Moon Bay, California. What's the basic workflow from iPhone scan to 3D print, and what apps do you use along the way? For me, it is uh, simply a uh, Polycam is what I'm using. I've been experimenting with a lot of other things. Uh, the other one that I've been playing with, though the scale isn't right, so the detail is better. Is um, the new? This is one you can't get yet. I mean, it's it's on it's in beta, and that is the new. Um, just, just make sure I get the name right. It, it is the, it's the um, uh, reality scan. So this is from reality, uh, reality creator. Is that right? No, re um, but reality scan, it's a it, unreal engine bot. Um, I don't know why I'm, I'm uh, reality capture. So reality capture is a company that does photogrammetry and mixture and LIDAR and so on and so forth. And they, they put out an iPhone app called reality scan. It went into beta for about 10,000 people. And I just happened to get on early. And um, it takes, you can take up to 200 photos of an object with your phone and it guides you. It's a very, uh, very pleasing thing to use as far as building that stuff out. And it builds a very high resolution model of, of your, of your object. Uh, and so it's, it's been, um, it, it was, it was, it's really, really good. Uh, it's better than Polycam. It takes a lot more work. Polycam, you kind of wave it over it and you get kind of a low resolution model. So reality scan is a better model, better modeler, but it takes a lot and it's limited to 200 photos. And so if you want more than 200 photos, you need to do something. If you go up to my, you can probably find my name on, on Sketchfab, you'll see um, some experiments that I did there. So it, it automatically uploads the Sketchfab from there. You download as an OBJ and from, from OBJ, you can take it into anything. So the OBJ is the waveform the wave front format and it's been around since the 90s and it just kind of goes into everything it's not great um usdz is a much more modern architecture and some of the other ones are glb and other ones like that are more modern than than um uh, and obviously stl is what you need to get to to print it uh, or typically what you export out is an stl file to to print but the um or what i export out but the um obj is what i what i usually export from from any of these packages so i i go reality scan to obj to sketchfab then download it from sketchfab bring it into cinema and now i can check the big thing is checking scale because the reality scan at least on the version that i have doesn't scale doesn't have accurate scale so i get it it comes in in a weird space the size um so i have to get the scale right um and then uh and you can do little things like sometimes i uh, I, I put something that is known into the scan. So I have like a cube that's one centimeter by one centimeter and I'll drop it into the scan and just scan the whole thing. And then as long as I scale everything down to the cube fitting, then I know everything else is accurate. Um, Polycam is better about the scale, um, but the resolution isn't as high. Um, next question. Next one comes from Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Have you changed the head on your 3D printer to add features or make for a finer print? Was it something you'd recommend uh, for people learning? Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I eventually, I recently replaced the hot end, which is the print head, I guess you could call it, uh, not the extruder, but the hot end, which is the part that heats up the filament and uh, extrudes it. The, the little hot block there is this little, this area right here, which is the uh, brass area where the heating element is, and the nozzle there uh, is replaceable. And those nozzles uh, determine the uh, the a resolution of your print and you can get them down to 0.2 millimeters usually 0.4 millimeters is 0.04 millimeters is 0.4 millimeters is what i normally print at and that's the most common size but you can get them in a variety of the sizes the bigger the nozzle the coarser the print the finer the nozzle the finer the print and uh, the nozzles are you know you can get 30 of them for you know five to ten dollars something like that so they're not expensive i've replaced that that one that i just showed there was uh 17 to replace the uh, entire hot end from an ender three uh and they're available in kit form and they they only take about 30 minutes or so to replace so pretty easy two screws hold them on you disassemble the thing uh screw on a new one and reassemble the little hoses that go back and hoses and re reattach the wires and you're good to go. Next question. Chad Lafarge, Columbia, Missouri. Are there any 3D printing services you've found to be helpful to ensure quality prints and materials your printer can't handle? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. 
uh, right near my house, I walk by it every night, is a company called Hollywood 3D Printing. And uh, they were in the business, although I do see a sign on the building that it is for lease. So I don't know if they're still in business or not, but uh, their sign is still out front. They still have stuff in the window, but they would print, uh, take designs for awards. Let's say, uh, you know, you have a special award for something you're designing and, and it has a 3D uh, a design to it. They will take it and print it and then have it cast in bronze or have it cast in some type of metal and electroplated, or they can uh, print it out in, in plastic just to show you what it looks like. And there's methods of using a 3D printed base to do lost wax uh, processing and metal. Uh, so, there are services that do that for you. And the one that, uh, uh, well, what was the one you mentioned earlier, Alex? Shapeways. Where send, Shapeways, where you can send your, just send you email off your design and, uh, you know, they send back uh, the results and you, you tell them what you want it printed out of, what type of metal and what type of finishing you want. And they send it back. Yeah. And there's another one, Exomet Exometry, um, that, that I know some folks that have used in the past that have been happy. But again, these are, especially when you want to start doing things like metal or, or something like that. You, I, I wouldn't try to do that on, on my own. I would, and there's, you know, and a lot of them you can print, you can have, you can send something out, build a printer and you say, I want a rubber, I want a rubber handle, but I want a solid, a, you know, a solid piece. And I want, and you can, you model all of those things and then send them out as separate pieces and they're all going to come back and hopefully fit back together. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, another place that 3d printing, um, makes a difference. I was talking to someone, they built a, just to kind of keep on brainstorming what you can do with it, they built um, a plug um, in a 3D printer that basically, um, you know, basically when it, it, he, they were able to print a ball <laughs> that was in the center of the plug that that uh, um, that was able to. They, I don't remember how they did it, but they somehow loose. It was the ball was just barely supported, and then they were able to loosen it, but it was printed inside of the system you know and um and they it and it was uh it was able to use it as a plug so water would go up and then let it go uh, next question next one comes from chris widener again in lafayette indiana much like making compound butter have you tried any of the techniques for making your own filament for specialty testing i have not i, I like my printer too much to put anything in it that isn't standardized go ahead courtney yeah there are extruders out there that you can buy that uh uh, some and there's some DIY people that have just taken a regular uh, a regular hot end and you you have to grind up your uh, your failed prints and so on and and put them into a, a, a chip type format and then it heats them up and melts them and pushes them through the extruder but it's a lot more trouble than it's worth <laughs> as far as price you're not going to save any money and the problem is that most of your failed prints are going to be with different colored different types of filament so you have to make sure that you only put pla with pla and so on and then the color ends up being brown once you mix all the colors together so. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> you tried chocolate TPU? Ew. Uh, Chris Whitener, Lafayette. Concrete printers for making houses. Is this the next step for set design? Yeah, if you've seen the houses that are printed by with the concrete printers, it's uh, it's not as not as great as you would think. Uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, set design. You don't want something permanent like concrete because yeah, you know, after you're through shooting, then the you biggest get a thing, concrete ha house in the middle of your stage that you have to get rid of. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing we out. learned. The biggest thing I learned with with set design was that how to make something look really really solid that is as light and disposable as possible. You know, and that was that's the whole trick. Um, yeah, canvas and muslin were the primary walls in most sets on stage and screen yeah. for a long time too. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, I, you know, I, I take, I, I will say I take exception. People spend a lot of time on these three, these concrete printers because the problem is, is that they're building out, they're building towns outward instead of upward and upward is the future. <laughs> like it's like, you know, so, you know, if you're gonna spend all that money and time, figure out ways to go up in a community uh, because you want to increase population density, not not um, not spread uh, from an environmental perspective, as well as just a, there's a whole bunch of things that. So increasing, I'm just going to go off on this for just a second because I, I watch these 3D printers and they these concrete printers, and I get so frustrated because I'm like, the the issue is is by creating a height in a in a building which these concrete printers can't do. Um, you create, you increase population density, which makes it a much more robust community. So it, it basically, you, it means that store, like, and you go to San Francisco, there can be a, there can be a, a little market 
on almost every corner because there's enough people to support that market. As soon as you start spreading, it makes it very hard. Anyway, that's my two cents about that. Um, the uh, as far as the, the these go, I, I I will go back to uh, when it comes to set design. There was a company that, and I here's the worst part is I lost their card and they don't have a website because you have to know who they are to do this. But we worked on a we were working on this big project and. A guy came in and cut a piece of wood without any of the dust hitting the ground. Some crazy, and I was like, what is that? And he looked at me like I was an idiot. Like, like I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what is what? And I was like, the saw. And he's like, oh, that's not, that's just, a, you know, he told us what it is. He goes, you should see the whole truck. And we go back into the parking area, into the loading dock, and they had a um, this tractor trailer truck that was a double expando. And inside was CNC mills and and um, they, had, they had two CNC mills and a printer, a couple printers, um, electronics, you know, soldering area, wood, a shop bot, like all these things were all built into this, this tractor trailer. And, um, and these three guys working and they just, that's all they did was custom, they built custom solutions for, um, for events. So you get to an event, all they do, you planned everything, you had everything made and all they do is you spend the $10,000 a day and they will park this truck with three people and they just fix everything that didn't quite work. <laughs> like, like that's all they do is just print things and add things and make a little, oh, you decide you want a neon sign. They build neon signs from scratch overnight. And so you can have a neon sign that does, does whatever you want it to do. And so um, I think that uh, when you think about this customization, you can really turn it into something. If you get enough of them pieces together, you can do almost anything. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I mean, 3D printing, actually, not 3D printing, but 3D construction has been around for quite some time. I look back, uh, I remember I was, grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and there's the Tower of the Americas in San Antonio. It was built in 1968, and this is how they built it. It's called concrete, and they have these this set of forms here that are uh, the shape of the tower, and they pour concrete into it, and then they wait till that concrete hardens, and they jack the forms up to the next level, and they pour another layer of concrete and jack the forms up. So yeah. that's really additive 3D printing right there. Right. And uh, that was in 1968. So uh, it's yeah. come a long way since then. It's not the extrusion type of printing, but it is uh, additive 3D. Next question. Douglas Carmichael up next with, could you see staging components and other load-bearing structures be printable? Uh it, 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 I, I think that anything you want to have load bearing, I really think subtractive processes rather than additive processes are much more stable. Uh, next question. Uh, Chris Widener, Lafayette. Pancake printers for crafty too. Is that too far for nerdy goodness? Um, I, I, th those ones I think are the least expensive. I, I, I think that you can get um, the pancake printers are, are not, they're like $1,000 or $500 or something like that. And um Wow, it's it's I I think it's called the pancake bot. Is that right? Um, and uh, it, <laughs> it looks awesome. I'm sorry, and it has the it comes with a hot plate. So it it basically because the w one of the things it does is it times it so that different things are browner than others inside of the whole system. And it's it's a pretty it's a pretty nifty little system. I don't know what I would use it for other than impressing my kids' friends when they come over for you know that that's you know half the reason you buy these things is so that your kids bring their friends over and you do crazy things uh, that make them look cool well, hopefully uh, or not and hopefully not stupid look uh, kids i have the mona lisa for your pancakes today. well you have to the kids have to approve it before you buy it that's the key is not to be the parent who who uh, buys the thing before the kids think it was cool um yeah go ahead uh, uh bill i saw somebody do a similar thing with a customized sifter and powdered sugar that was kind of fun i saw that about 10 years ago a chef at a high-end restaurant would bring crepes over and then they had a little powder sugar duster and he had created little templates and so you could do snowflakes on top of the crepes yeah. you could do other things it was kind of fun so i love the fact that people are creative like this with foods <laughs> i have i have i have a coffee one for chocolate so that you can put little symbols on on the lattes it's fun next question Douglas Carmichael, the U.S. Marine Corps printed a part for the F-35 fighter jet and modeled it in Blender. And he's got a link there to the article. Wouldn't Blender not be the right tool for engineering level accuracy? Yeah, I, I have a feeling if they printed it and they made it out of Blender, it probably wasn't a piece that was going to be mission critical. <laughs> so they, 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 I'm sure they pay 
Grumman or whoever, you know, thousands of dollars for that piece. <laughs> so, so it's, if it's mission critical, it's probably something relatively small and, and press worthy more than useful worthy. Go ahead, Courtney. And a lot of times they'll print these 3D metal parts and then they grind them on a CNC mill to the precision dimensions that they need. So they start with them slightly oversized right. and they grind them down to exactly the dimensions they need. Uh, last question for the hour. Juan C. Robles of CDMX in Mexico says, how do you recycle your failed prints? I don't think there's any way to recycle them. I think that failed prints are destined for the trash. They're not, it's not recyclable material, I don't think. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, well, you can, you can grind them up and, and recycle them. But like I say, because of the color issue, you know, you're going to end up with brown <laughs> eventually, unless you're going to add black dye to it and make black filament, which is the most popular colored filament. Uh, PLA, you don't worry about because it's basically made from cornstarch. Uh, so it's biodegradable eventually, uh, and will break down and go back to the earth, uh, from which it came. The the non uh, you know the the non biodegradable plastics like the ABS and so on you know you you may want to put those into some type of recycling uh, bin to take into someone who recycles plastics but uh, I usually just toss them. There you go. I when I did it when I when I thought the subject I was like I don't know if we can do a whole hour on three D but we did three D printing because we that's what we do. It's a great job by the producers for lots of really insightful questions. It was, it was a really good hour. And uh, thanks to our panelists for, uh, we can't do this without you, for both the first hour and the second hour. And thanks to the behind the scenes team doing such great work and uh, producing such great programs. So really well done. Um, it's getting better every single day. Well, almost every day, but every week, every single week, it's getting better. Sometimes we, we step back for a day <laughs> as we figure stuff out. But uh, today I thought it looked really clean. All right. Uh, let's uh, jump into After Hours. I went five minutes over. I'm trying to hit. Did you see? Did you see that I, I hit the top of the hour? Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to talk about my little Two. 3D printed collars. <laughs> oh, dang nabbit. BNC collars. What are those? You slip them over a BNC connector and... You can get your oh, hands. right. We didn't get to talk about this. You have the rear twist versions and you can put these on without taking the connector off. You should have brought that up at the beginning. 